What's up guys, welcome back to the shop. In today's video, we're gonna be continuing on with the Lion Lathe project, and we're gonna be focusing on the compound and specifically scraping the compound and getting it scraped in. So off camera, we went ahead and disassembled this. It wasn't that big of a deal, so we didn't show it. And good news, the crossfeed screw, or the, the screw and the nut don't have any real wear, and that makes a lot of sense based on the minimal use of this lathe. Um, and the compound is used way less than the top slide. And so we're gonna be able to put this back together and not need to make anything there, which is really nice. And that theme continues on with the actual compound. Now this compound is in very good shape. And I might throw some B-roll in before of me taking it apart and also uh, doing some scraping off camera because I did take an unofficial scraping class in which I brought this and worked on it. Now, did it need to be scraped in? No, it didn't. It was very, very good and very close, but I wanted some practice, and so we did some scraping on it. And uh, I'll give you a better shot of the print of where we last left off, but for the most part, the base is done, um, and we did that during the class. And I started on this top part and we're gonna mostly probably focus on getting this top part dialed in during the video. So let's bring you in closer and talk about where we're at. Just to give you an idea of the base that we're working with, I basically came in here with a hand scraper during Ron's class and just put some cross hatch marks. I only did one pass per side in both directions, but that'll be a nice little base for us to get going. Now that we have the power scraper, we can really come in here and do some work so we can start to move and make some progress. Finally, we get to crack out this bad boy and get to work. This is the very first time using the Biax, so we're just gonna get it started in a higher speed and go over to the part and start with a nice cross hatch pattern. I know we already had this pattern before with a hand scraper, but I would like to go ahead and come in here and just get a real nice pattern with the power scraper. With the first cross hatch pattern done, I wanted to really get deep into the dovetails. When you're scraping, it's easy to forget about this inner part. And over time, after many layers of scraping, it can build a little bit of a ridge. And that'll be a problem when you fit your parts together. So by hand scraping, you can really get into the corner. Sometimes using the power scraper, it's kind of tough to get back into that area. Later in the process, we're gonna start bluing these up and fitting them together. But until we get to that point, I've been using a Sharpie marker just to kind of mark the surface while we get an initial crosshatch pattern. Here we're going ahead and just doing another pass in the other direction. This is just gonna give us a really nice starting point so we can have really good contact. Otherwise, if you don't get a nice crosshatch pattern before you do a print, it's easier to get a smear because you don't have any lows or highs for the blue to really fit into. Let's go ahead and get this bad boy wiped down. The acetone does a really good job at removing the Sharpie marker and or later in the process when we start to use our pigment. Then we'll come in here with a whetstone and just remove some of the burrs. We went ahead and used that Sure Shot and some kerosene just as a lubricant so we can get everything ready for the next step. Now it's time to do our very first print, which is really exciting. We're gonna be using some of this pigment that I made out of concrete powder. I talk about that in a previous video. We have the blue for the dye and then the yellow we're gonna be using as a highlighter. We're gonna then take this blue over to our master part. This we've checked on the surface plate and we're gonna go ahead and use this part to test the top of the compound and see where our highs and lows are. Now I am laying it on a little bit thick here, which is technically not ideal. However, when you're learning, having it a little bit thicker can make it a little bit easier to see. It is less precise and more prone to smearing. However, in the beginning when you're roughing, it'll kind of give you a general idea of where the zones are, but is gonna be a little bit less accurate. So as we refine our scraping pattern, having a much thinner print is gonna be a little bit more crucial. Well, here comes the moment of truth. Let's get this bad boy on here and see how our print did. 
Now, this bad boy is about 40 or 50 pounds. It's a lot heavier than it seems. So I'm trying to get it on here without scooting it or sliding it because in the front and back of our faces, that's gonna give us a smear. So once we got it on here, we're just gonna slide it back and forth with nice even pressure and then we'll pull it off and see how we did. We're looking real nice, especially at the ends over here and in the middle, you can see where we have contact. Overall, this looks really good and I'm really happy with our first print. As far as the stroke length, we have this set to a medium-ish stroke length. Ideally, I would like to rough with a longer stroke length, but being as though we are close to the dovetails, a super long stroke length can be problematic because it wants to dig into the corners. So later on, we'll turn it down a little bit and get finer as we go. But for now, this is working out really nice. On to our second print. And typically you can expect to do about 20 to 50 rounds of this type of work, depending on how efficient you are and how bad the machine is worn out. In this case, we probably get away with about 20 because the top of our compound really is in good shape. Honestly, this is looking really good. We have good coverage all the way around. If you take a look at the front, here's some of that smearing that we were talking about. You have to be careful when you put this on, it's really easy for it to smear. And to be honest, we're probably a little heavy on our print, but otherwise our contact area is looking pretty good. Let's take a break from that top piece and start working on our master. I went ahead and did a print on my surface plate. I used the crane to flip this over so we could get a good print. When I was at Ron's shop, I was using a cast iron surface plate and I brought that up to the top of this. But since we have the crane, it's easy to flip over and get a really good print and see how we're doing. So far, everything looks really good. That means everything we did at Ron's shop was successful and I can continue to trust this as a master. Even though scraping is just about as much fun as watching paint dry, I've went ahead and sped this up and done about 10 more passes, and this is how we look. We're getting down to the point where we're gonna be doing some more minor corrections and really coming there and starting to hit these main points. And let's get this guy slid on here so we can near the end of the finish line, at least when it comes to scraping these flats. We'll get this squeegeed out and flip it over and see how we look. Not bad, to be honest, this is looking really nice. Now this isn't gonna win any 40 points per inch awards, but this is looking really good. I'm just gonna come in here and pick off some of these blue spots and then we'll call it good enough. Flipping over to the other side, we're just cleaning up some of these spots. We have a real short stroke length and we're trying to come in here as best as we can and only hit the blue, leaving the yellow highlighter remaining. And you really get down to the end where it gets really satisfying when you can have that really nice fine grain surface finish texture. Now we'll come in here for the last time hit this with some 409 and come in here and just knock the burrs down and do a very last and final print on the flat surfaces. After about 40 different prints, here's where we're finishing out and I'm very happy with the result. Let's jump back over to the bench and start focusing on the master. The next step is to work on the dovetails on the base or what I'm calling the master. So the process for doing this is relatively straightforward. We want to work on the non-gib side first. We want to establish that as straight and flat. Once that's done, we're going to take our top piece and we're going to use this master side to go ahead and print the other piece 
and uh, make our corrections on that. Once we get these two sides done, both on the top and the bottom, uh, then what we can do is we can take a measurement across the top piece to make sure that it is horizontal or, or parallel, sorry, the whole distance. And then we'll make adjustments there. We'll work on the other side as it relates to the first side of the top piece. And then we'll go in there and we'll fit the gib. So to get started on the first side, we have a straight edge here. Now this straight edge is a little unwieldy. It's a little bit big, but it is the only straight edge that I have that's angled. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this surface prepared and blued up, and then we'll transfer it over to this dovetail. I'm expecting the first rub to be more of a smear, but we're just trying to see where our lows and highs are. So let's get some blue on here, and then let's do our first rub. We got the straight edge blued up, and we're ready to do our first print. Ironically, the hard part about doing dovetails is the positioning. You have to get parts in really weird situations just to be able to comfortably get a good print, but that is really crucial because you wanna be able to trust it. Now the fun begins. We're gonna start scraping in this dovetail. We're really just trying to get a cross hatch pattern going. We're not too concerned with the print right now, uh, but it is a little bit hard to get into this crevice, and so I'm experiencing with different ways, whether it's with the angled scraper or with the straight scraper, so we can get in here and be successful. Ironically, I had a lot of success flipping the scraper upside down, and here we're going ahead and flipping the part vertically. I can come in there, and I really have the best techniques doing it this way. Time for our first print. We're gonna bring the straight edge over here and see how we're looking. Having the part flipped around like this makes it really easy to get the straight edge in here and hold it and position it with gravity so we can get a decent marking without any smearing. After doing that first print, it was pretty clear that the print was pretty uneven. So instead of showing you guys that print, I just blew it up the surface with the marker and came back to do some step scraping. We ended up being pretty high on both ends, so I just wanted to quickly knock that down with a couple of rounds of step scraping and then see where we were with the print. After a few rounds of scraping, this is where we ended up. We are still a little heavy on the front edge here, but I'm gonna tune that in off camera. For the most part, it's a little hard to show this just because of the positioning. So we're gonna be moving on to the top piece of the compound and focus a little bit more on that. Moving over to the top of the compound, it's really important that we figure out the parallelism of these dovetails. So in order to do that, we have some micrometers over here. So that way we can measure between the dovetails and see what the measurements are. Uh, that'll give us a little bit of a guide so we know where we need to scrape. And then we can use that master that we just scraped to test fit everything. Now, ironically, I don't have the right size micrometer Really, I need a four to five inch, and I have three different sizes that are all really good shape, but I just don't have the right size. So we're gonna be using some of these spacer blocks. Looks like some gauge blocks and some gauge pins, so I can come in here and accurately measure this. The measurements themselves are not that critical. We are looking for a comparative measurement here. So we're just gonna go down the part and then write the number of the measurement on the compound. And then once we go all the way down, we'll have a nice little map to see how far in or out we are. Now, my guess here is that we're gonna be within about a thousandths from the top to the bottom, but let's see how we're gonna end up finishing out. Now that we have the flats of this scraped, we came in here and took our measurements and made a little map. Now, ironically, we had a little bit of a weird reading and I left it in here so that you can see how sensitive these measurements are. So I had not touched the dovetails on this part at all, and I came in here and did a measurement and went ahead and wrote everything here on the left. And I was getting a deviation, and it really was kind of a weird wear pattern. So then I came back and stoned everything and just made sure there were no burrs or no dust, and I remeasured again. And as you can see on the right side, I have a lot more of a linear pattern. Uh, it was a line where the front was a little bit less worn and the back was a little bit more worn. That's really what I would have expected to see on something like this. It just kind of goes to show you how much of a difference it can make uh, just by having some burrs removed and making sure everything is nice and clean. Typically, machines either wear 
in a line or sometimes they can wear in kind of a bell curve where more of the wear is in the center. Uh, but originally I was getting that kind of mountainous wear pattern, which doesn't really seem too accurate. So overall, this is pretty good shape. We have a difference of about 1.2 thousandths uh, from high to low. So now we'll be able to go in there and really work on that. And since the front is where most of the wear is, that's an area that we're gonna avoid a little bit. We're gonna focus step scraping on the back where there is more material. And then once we get it worn down to a more even surface, then we'll come in here and really try to pick the points out. Now we're coming in here and blowing up this dovetail. This is just offering contrast. So when we start scraping, we can see where we're at. Again, we're gonna just come in here and step scrape first before we even try to take a print. And then once we have a decent measurement, then we'll see where we're at as far as printing wise. After taking multiple passes, this is where we ended up. A lot of this scraping is extremely repetitive, so I'm trying to speed this along for you here. Uh, but you can see we have really good contact all the way down. We have a decent amount of breakup in our points. And for what we're gonna be doing, this is more than sufficient. We're gonna be using this side to go ahead and measure off of. And then we'll make our adjustments on the other side so that we're nice and parallel. And we have really good coverage as well. So let's get this part flipped over and start working on the other side. Before we start scraping on the Gibb side, I wanna show you how I read the side. If you look at the scraping here, this is all existing from the factory. So you can tell where the scraping is heavier there and then becomes lighter in the front. That information is extremely helpful and we can synthesize that with our measurements to make sure that everything looks consistent and everything lines up. That's something that's really important when it comes to scraping. You do need to have a little bit of doubt when you're looking at measurements. Stuff can be misleading because you're working with such small measurements. So ideally you need to have multiple ways to verify the measurements so that way you don't go chasing your tail. I've blued up only 85% of this part. We're gonna step scrape up until that line repeat that process and keep doing that until our measurements look good. Then once we get to that point, we'll take a more accurate print off of the master and see how we're looking up. With our step scraping out of the way, we're gonna do our very first print and see how everything turns out. I've been using this quick release vise to hold it up. Getting a good position is really important. We wanna make sure that we're not rocking this too much and that we have nice even pressure. So what we're seeing is nice and accurate. Not bad for a first print overall. We actually have pretty good coverage. That step scraping works out really well. When you do it properly, it really increases the efficiency. And then when you go to the first print, you really cut down on a lot of effort. We actually have really good coverage overall and we have decent points per inch as well as bluing along the whole surface. Let's get this back over to the master and see how we look and kind of make our fine adjustments from there. Finally, we're coming down to the home stretch. Now that we got this off of the master, we can see our print is looking really good. Uh, let's get this guy flipped over and see how we're measuring out. But overall, I'm really happy with the points per inch and the coverage that we're seeing here on this piece. But I'm really interested to see how we measure out. With the part flipped over, you can see where we are measurement wise. Honestly, we're not where we need to be, but we're close. It looks like we have about seven tenths of a dip in the middle. The ends seem to be very consistent at 59 each, and in the center, it's about 58 and 3 tenths. So that'll be a 7 tenths dip in the center. I'm gonna go ahead and work this some more off camera, but overall, we are getting very close. With the top two pieces fitting well, it's time to move on to the gib. Now, anytime you're scraping a gib, you wanna make sure you stone the area where the gib adjuster screw is. That area can have a nice raised burr, so we're just using some 409 and I'm spending a little bit more time stoning this because I wanna see how it hinges. Hinging is a technique that we haven't really talked much about, it can be used on any part you're scraping, but it gives you a general idea where the highs and lows are. And specifically on a gib, it's a really easy and quick thing to do. 
And it also shows you if you're bowed and on a gib, that's very likely to be the case. So it gives you a quick indication of where you need to start looking at. As far as where you wanna be hinging, about 30% from each end is recommended. If you're hinging in the middle, that shows you where your high spot is. And if it's on the ends, it's kind of the same concept. So in this case, we're looking really good. We're back over at the compound and we're getting ready to fit the gib. We're just getting the compound blued up. Now you can go ahead and preemptively scrape the gib. Uh, typically I would do that, but this gib actually has a lot of scrape marks on it from the factory. So we're just gonna get it pushed in and see where we're starting at. And I don't expect to do a lot of work on this, especially because we see factory scraping and we were hinging pretty good. For the first print, we're just gonna get it pushed in and then tap it back out. We're not gonna worry about sliding back and forth. We're just trying to get a rough idea of where the print is. Typically with Gibbs, it's likely that they're gonna be smeared. So you don't have to be as particular with the points per inch, but overall this Gib is looking really good even on the initial print. Again, we're using Sharpie marker here. It's nice and quick. We're not using it to print. We're just using it to cover our existing scrape marks. That way, when we go in the opposite direction, it's easy to see. And then once we have a nice cross hatch pattern, we can get rid of that and go back to the original method of bluing and see how we're looking. With the cross hatch pattern done, we can now get this stoned and ready to get slid back in and see how we're looking. I'm going to go ahead and use a screwdriver to hold this in while we slide this back and forth to get a more accurate print. This is really not the proper way to do it. Ideally, you would take those gib screws and install them front and back uh, and set the tension properly. But as we go, obviously I'm learning a little bit more, um, but the concept worked. It's just a little bit more cumbersome doing it this way. Let's get that gib tapped out and see how we're looking. Remember, smearing is a lot more common on Gibbs, so that's something we need to watch out for. But overall, that looks pretty good. Honestly, I'm really satisfied with that, and that's probably good enough for what we're trying to do. Here's another close-up just to give you an idea. Uh, the print is a little on the heavier side, but you can see we have good coverage all the way down. We do have a slight hollow there on the end, but to be honest, this is going to work really nice for what we're doing, and we're going to roll with it. Well, I'm really happy with the way that this compound is turning out. We got everything scraped in and fit real nice, and we're pretty much done with the work we need to do here, but there are a couple of things additional that we gotta do to this uh, before it's done done. The main thing is, is we need to uh, finish getting the oiling system set up that I added or modified. So currently, as it sat factory, there was no way to oil the ways. Uh, on, the, on the bottom, both the flatways and the dovetail. And it's not a huge concern because this doesn't get a lot of usage. You could just run this back and apply oil to the surface here. Uh, but as you can maybe see in the shot, we've added some oil grooves. And then also I've drilled holes on the top piece here that come down into uh, lines that are milled onto the bottom and I can throw a photo in there of what that looks like so that way we can add some oil uh, down from the top and get to that surface. So we need to come in here and drill these out and counter bore it for some of these 10 millimeter ball oilers and that'll just prolong the life of this compound and keep everything well lubed. And then the other thing that we need to do is make some modifications in this region for the new tool post that we're gonna be using. The tool post uh, does screw in here like normal. However, it has a base plate that gets tapped and secured into the actual compound. So that work needs to be done as well. But we'll be doing that at a later date uh, once the machine is mostly assembled. Other than that, most of the work here is done and definitely the scraping work has been finished on this part. Um, the next step is to move on to the carriage slash top slide and start scraping on that guy. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed this scraping video, and we will see you guys on the next one to tackle the carriage. Future Kyle here coming back with some bonus content for you. I'm really curious to see what you guys think about our voiceover work. Typically I don't do that, but with this being a scraping video and being very monotonous, I thought it'd be kind of boring to watch. So I thought it'd be a good chance to do some experimenting. I know a lot of channels do voiceover and it can be very successful. It really just depends on the content. I'm really curious to hear from you guys if you think it's adding to the video or really distracting the video. Next week, we're gonna release another series on scraping and I'm gonna have Chris do that video with no voiceover so we can have a little bit of a comparison, but I am just really curious to see what you guys think is better. Doesn't mean that I'm gonna do that in the future, but I do wanna make these videos as good and as watchable as possible. So just let me know down below. We'll see you guys in the next one.